Buckle your seat belts, folks. We are going to take you on a trip you are not going to believe today. Welcome to New Day Cleveland. I'm David Moss, and along with Natalie, we're going to visit a place called the Hildebrandt Building. And if you take a look at this big board up here, it says Hildebrandt Provision Company. And this is a place that was a meat processing company decades ago and is now being transformed into something totally new and different. And I gotta tell you something, when you find this place, you're not gonna believe it. It's got all kinds of little businesses inside of it. To find it, first of all, you come up Clark Avenue and you get around 38th, you look up in the air and there's this big, beautiful smokestack and it says Hildebrandt on it, so you know you're in the right place. And the man who's making sure that this place is still alive, well, and maybe even growing again, yes. is Bill Hildebrandt, how are you? Fine, fine. Give me a little Welcome. shake there. Thank you very much. I gotta tell you, this is a crazy place to me because this looks like a place that it could maybe crumbled on top of itself, but you've saved it. It's like a, like a family heirloom. Uh, the, uh, our mom would always say, I cannot let go of Dad's building. So uh, that's how I entered into the picture. So we're talking about Dad's building here, which is a big building. How big is this building? It's almost a block big. Uh, we go from Clark Avenue right through to Walton. We actually have two zip codes. And um, we're at about 120,000 square feet. Now, when we start walking through this place, this is going to blow your mind because it's almost like walking through, I don't know, it's all where destruction meets art and yes. creativity. I right. mean, we've got people here selling tea, coffee, packaging, processing. We've got artists in here that are, what, they've got kilns fired up in here, glass artists. So how would you describe it to somebody? That Most important thing was to protect the building. No more tow motors, no more heavy equipment. The construction of the building really uh, adds to the value for artists. And that is because great grandpa being German, everything has to be brick, mortar, concrete. Even the roof is concrete. Yeah. So this goes very well with an artist that uh, might do um, anything that does with flames, heat, whatever. We're, we are, we're safe to go here. I love it. In the front of the building, you got this big, beautiful kitchen that was repurposed in there. You got the, the tea lady in your, was it your great, great grandfather's office? Well, I was in the back of the building. You got food trucks parked out there. They're making food. You got somebody making kimchi and sauerkraut in the building. How wild is that? And then the guys out there like repurposing antiques, chopping up old things and gluing them yes. together to make new things. That is a very good growing market. So what we're going to do is we're going to start this tour now, the Hildebrandt Building. And what's the slogan that goes right underneath it? Uh, building of dreams. Let the dream begin. I absolutely love this building because there is really so much to explore. We are just getting started in this hour-long show. I have Katie with me, and we are up on what floor are we on in the building here? The second we're floor. We're on the second floor. So this is where you can come find her here. You do two really cool and unique things here, and you loom. I do. And I, you dye. I do. So we're gonna start with the dyeing process here. Why did you get started doing this? Well, I've always liked cooking, and I've always liked fiber art, so I wanted to combine those two loves together. Um, these marigolds are from Ohio City Farm. I work at Great Lakes Brewing Company, so we work very closely with that farm, and I saw that these were just gonna wilt away, and I'd rather them be made into something beautiful. So I take thrift store finds. So this is a silk shirt that I maybe paid a dollar for, and I lay it out. I love it. Yes. And I can cut this up, I can keep it as such, whatever I like to do. And so these marigolds are gonna elicit kind of a yellowish orangish color. So this will permanently dye the mm -hmm. shirt. And it's there forever. So these are actually from last year. I was able to freeze them. So in the middle of winter, when you kind of get a little stir crazy, I have some stuff to play with. And it's kind of fresh and it kind of reminds me of the spring and summer and being at the farm. So you, you said it's, it's fiber mm -hmm. art? Yes. So what does that technically mean, fiber art? So, you're using um, so it encompasses a lot, so I can use different fibers. So I can use wool, cotton, silk, usually natural fibers. Um, I like dyeing, I like kind of the whole process of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times when I'm doing things, I don't think about the end product, I just think about what I'm doing in the moment. So it's almost meditative for you. So I spin, I weave, I dye, and then... So I love that, she has to think about the end product, so you never know how it's gonna turn no. out, possibly. And you're just in the moment enjoying it. Yes, and with natural dyeing, you never know what you're gonna get anyway. So I just go with it, and if it's not what I want, I add more dye or do something else to it. Wow. So just build upon so it. So how would this work then? You have the flowers in there. Mm -hmm. How long, do you, do you have to squeeze it tight and, and pull it together? Or? Yeah, so I'm gonna put these all in here, and I kind of roll it up a little bit, so some of the color is gonna be deeper. It's gonna almost have a little bit of a tie-dye effect to it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I tie this up, other times I don't and then I just place it in the pot and let it boil for a couple hours 
So you would just put just it in there right it. now like that? And so I can work on another project, I can do whatever I like, I can read a book, so it's kind of one of those things that you have the moment here, but you have a great thing at the end too. You, you work on that loom and it's yes. just, She's incredible over there. So <laughs> what kind of products do you use for that? Is that recycled materials? So those are actually mostly t-shirts and scrap fabric. Okay. So we have Andrea Howell's uh, fashion designer here. So she'll give me her excess fabric and I'll make it into almost a yarn and then I'll weave with it so nothing's wasted. I can make bags, shirts, anything like that. Wow, now how long does it take you to put something like that together? Oh, that could take that some time. That takes some time. So setting up the loom is the big part. So once you have that set up, it's the fun part is just the weaving and that's really fast because you don't want to stop once you start. Now was that something maybe your grandmother, your mother, someone taught you? Or, because I think that's an interesting thing that younger generations, when you find someone who's still into that, mm -hmm. I, I love that aspect of it, but not everyone is. So. Was it a generational thing for you or? It was a little bit. My grandmother sewed, so she's the one that taught me to sew. She used to make all of her own clothes. So I remember being in elementary school and learning to sew from her. And so when I got to college, I realized that there's more to fiber arts than just sewing. So I was at Hale Farm when I was a kid, when I was a brownie and I saw someone weaving and I was like, someday I'm gonna do that. And so I had really great teachers in college that let me try everything I wanted to do. And so I've traveled the world and go, I go to South America a lot and I do weaving there. So you are here up on this floor with a lot of other great people. Yes. So when I first saw this building, I fell in love with it. It's a beautiful building, has so much history. It's so very Cleveland to me. And when I first met the owner, he showed me this huge space. It's 5,000 square foot. I have a bathroom, we have a gallery, we have a workspace, we have an office, we have a storage space, and it's little old me. <laughs> so when he first approached me, I said, well, let me talk to my friends. And next thing I know, I had 12 other people that were in the space with me. It's kind of been an evolving thing for me living in Cleveland and being able to afford an art space is a big deal. So mm -hmm. most of the time they're hundreds of dollars. This way we can all work together. We collaborate on projects. So we have Bernadette, she's a painter here. She's amazing and very talented. She'll still be working with me as well. Uh, Ryan Raymer makes mobiles. He's a classical composer. So all these different mediums can work together. Uh, Andrea Howell, she's a fashion designer and has her own shop in Tremont called Title Cool. Uh, we also have Adrian, he's a painter. And we have Lauren, she's a graphic designer and makes jewelry. So all of us combined, we can make some amazing things. Well, we are gonna continue our great hour long show here at Hildebrandt Factory Building. I love this building and I think it's really neat. And we're gonna show you so many more great artists. Well, I started uh, from art school and studied uh, photography and then started doing silkscreen uh, enamels onto ceramics because I liked incorporating the imagery with architecture. Welcome back to New Day Cleveland. We are on this wild trip through the Hildebrandt building, but we're sort of not in the Hildebrandt building right now because I'm with Anthony and it says wrap it up on a shirt and we're inside of... A food truck. A food truck, that's right. I saw a whole bunch of food trucks in one of the rooms over here and it looks like a lot of guys have them here or you guys have a bunch? Yeah, there's uh, well, there's us and there's about three or four other food trucks that operate out of the same uh, building in here. They, they house their trucks here and use the commissary kitchen on the other side of the building. So. This is a crazy building, man. Where oh. are you going? I mean, it's from soup to nuts, literally. Yeah, it's everything. It's, yeah. uh, it's so diverse and that's one of the, the great things about being here is that uh, there's just so many different things going on and so many yeah. different people that it, you, you never get tired of If of you don't have people. an idea, you'll get an idea. Yeah, yeah that's it. Very okay, inspiring. So, so wrap it up. So what are you going to make here? Okay, we're going to make you the, uh, one of our more popular ones. It's our buffalo chicken mac and cheese wrap. I like that idea. Yeah, so it's got all the right words in it. All the right, all the, all the good stuff. So we're gonna start by chopping up our crispy chicken here, and then we're gonna toss them in our our own buffalo sauce that we make. Look at that little crispy chicken there. Pretty good crispy chicken. Thank you, thank you. My kids would go crazy for that. Oh, uh, this is one of our hottest items right here. We start out with some of our Fritos corn chips. Oh, just to make put it some crunch. Yeah, make it even more crunchy. We layer those on there nice. And we come in here with our nice creamy macaroni and cheese. Oh, my stars. Toss our crispy chickens right in there. Whoa! And then give it a nice roll. Which hand do you like? Which hand do I like? Let, do you like? I mean, it looks like something big that you smoke. Oh. <laughs> No. <laughs> no. Because that thing's got some firepower in it. This is, uh, that thing will put you down. That, <laughs> that is, 
That is a meal, that, my That's a meal and a wrap. That hey, is our, our whole purpose. Nancy, it's got my name on this bag. So yes. what's going on this in here? This is an inside here I made for you earlier, a veggie burger wrap. It's another one of our popular ones. Veggie burger wrap. So we got that here. It's uh, spinach, pico de gallo, honey chipotle aioli, cucumbers, and then our hand pat our hand patted uh, veggie burgers. And what's going on in here? And these are our, uh, one of our loaded top toppings. Would you open that for me? So, so, so go, tell me how you made this. Look at this thing here. So we drop our tiger tots in the deep fryer, uh -huh. get them nice and crispy, and then we toss them in Cajun dust. After that, hey, what? Cajun dusting. Oh. A little bit of uh, honey chipotle aioli on top of there, um, some crispy bacon, and then pico de gallo. That's one of our more famous uh, tots. Wow. All of our tots have different toppings that you can top with and make them, customize them to your own. I like the, it's got a nice sparky flavor, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Not, not too much, but a little bit of heat on there, so. Yeah. Just, so, just enough to let you know it's there, you That's know? That's great. I love this thing here. So, yeah. so how many different things do you make? Uh, we have five standard wraps on our menu, and then we also uh, do a featured wrap every month that we switch out. Right. Um, different things like Lent time, we did a fish and chips wrap last year. We'll probably do one of those again. Okay. So it's a truck. You drive places. So yes. where do people find you? Uh, well, you can go on our website, and our schedule is posted there for the month um, at wrapitupfoodtruck.com. Uh, you can also find us on streetfoodfinder.com. Um, primarily what we do is uh, go around to businesses and we'd like to do morale boosting type things. We bring games and activities and Nerf guns and we do lunch services. You say Nerf guns? Nerf guns. <laughs> Nerf guns, giant Jenga, uh, all kinds of big, big games uh, try and improve you know, work environments. That's that's one of our core focuses. How about here. if I was going to have a graduation party? Oh or yeah, something we like absolutely that. do cater. No, that would be awesome. Oh yeah, uh, we can come cater on location to your place. You don't have to do anything except call us and set us up. And uh, we'll come out. We'll do the food. We take the mess with us, so you don't, it's worry-free. And you get a whole crew. Absolutely, yeah. Not just me. <laughs> I wish I could do it all by myself. Andy, but you're beautiful. I got plenty of staff. Check it out here, huh? I'm gonna put. What is this one? This is your veggie burger. Got the veggie burger. That's your buffalo chicken mac and this cheese. This one's crazy. Yeah. And this one I'm gonna eat here. All right. It's unbelievable. It's beautiful. Wrap it up. Call these guys. Call us, please. Come on, have some fun. Yeah, we yeah. are fun. As you walk through the Hildebrand building, it is one discovery after the next. For example, behind that door is the creative space of another amazing artist. Hi, I'm Greg Aliberti, owner of Aliberti Art Tile, where we specialize in site-specific art tile installations. A variety of customers, for instance, at the West 65th RTA station, I did a cityscape mural inside their main waiting area. And for the Cleveland Clinic, I did a series of art tile benches for their nature walk. We uh, also have a, a boutique tile line of tiles that are ideal for residential backsplashes and fireplace surrounds. Here at the ceramic studio, we practice a variety of different techniques, such as uh, slab construction, uh, extruded ceramic profiles, and silkscreen enamels for photographs and polychromatic designs. We've been here at the Hildebrandt building for about 10 years now, I believe. And uh, it's a great space and a lot of different uh, disciplines are under one roof, which is ideal for artists and, and entrepreneurs that often work in small groups, but it's nice to have a larger place where we can all work together and brush shoulders and get to see other people in their own discipline. Well, I started uh, from art school and studied uh, photography and then started doing silkscreen uh, enamels onto ceramics because I liked incorporating the imagery with architecture. So I began doing the silkscreen work and then I wanted to get more three-dimensional and I started doing press molded relief tile and then extruded ceramics and then I wanted to start installing them because I felt like the gallery studio environment was lacking in a permanent type environment where you're creating an installation that people can enjoy for years and years and not just something you set up for a month and then sell it and break apart and sell to individual people. I like the idea of creating site specific installations that people can enjoy. I extruded a lot of uh, ceramic profiles for Cove Tile yesterday and then that has to set up overnight. In ceramics you always have to do things in stages. So today I came in and I started trimming the tile and then I'll transfer the tiles to different wear boards and start the drying process for it to be best in the kilns over there. 
Well, the least amount of hours would be probably be 30 hours, and then it could be a series of weeks, like when I do the larger scale installations for public venues, it could be like six month project. Maybe six months ahead of that is design and development and coordinating with the client, and then another six months to make it. But a lot of the projects turn around in four to six weeks, uh, especially the residential projects where somebody can come to me and we can discuss what they would like, and I can come up with a lot of ideas for them, and then come to an agreement and I can just start making the tile right away. Here at the studio I have plenty of room so that I can work on a series of different projects at once and juggle them as I need to. I'm open to a lot of different people's ideas, uh, but as far as scale, I've, I've done whole facades like Red Steak House or uh, large scale murals that are 15 feet across. So I don't have a problem with uh, doing larger scale work. I'm actually uh, in the process of Develop, uh, creating a lot of tiles for a river walk in Seattle which was going to be 200 feet long. So uh, my tile will be incorporated into that project so I guess the answer is no. No project is too small or too large because I've done like dedication plaques for uh, environmental center over here in Ohio City which was just a series of eight inch tiles or zone rack I did a dedication tile for them as well. That's a fun project especially with the silk screen work where you can create one specific art piece made out of a tile, but then reproduce it. You can admire the work of Alberti Art Tile all over our area, but I would say the best place to start is online. When we come back, it's tea time. Welcome back. We are on the first floor of the Hildebrandt building and we are here at Storehouse Tea. And Paula, I hear that this is probably one of the coolest spaces in the building because yes. it was Great Grandpa Hildebrandt's That's office. That's right. Yeah. Great Grandpa's office. The so main guy. <laughs> he was the it guy here. So you've taken over yeah. quite. So yeah. if these walls could talk, I'm sure there's so many oh, stories. I am. Absolutely. You've been doing this 10 years now with tea. Yeah. So you've brought in a whole new level, something different to explore here in the building. Yep. And when it comes to your tea, there is quite a variety. You have how many different blends? We have about 50 different blends. I love tea, but have you always been a tea drinker? Not always. I, I really started out as a coffee drinker and really drank way too much. And I had some health issues, so I had to back off. And I discovered loose tea and fell in love with it and it made me feel really good. And so I explored it and just kind of really delve into what all the health benefits were, um, how easy it was to get. And as I searched into the industry, I decided to start a business in it and started producing our own line of tea. So we started with 10 and then moved into 20 and 30 and 40. And now we're up to 50. 50. So, so each tea that you that you do, each blend that you create, because you mm -hmm. create all of the blend yourself. You, right. you, Buy the, the yes. ingredients. All the ingredients. Yep. How do you know what goes good with what, or how do you how do you come up with these great yeah. blends? Well, really, I mean, studying the industry, of course, seeing what's out there, and then tasting, just tasting and tasting and tasting. I know I should expand and explore a little bit more. And this yeah. pomegranate, are they all organic? Yeah. Your teas? They're all organic. Yep. Okay. Yep. So this with white tea, this white tea looks like something yeah. I feel like I this have to really try. This is really good. So white teas are actually low in caffeine. They are not fermented. So that means like the black tea that you enjoy um, is fermented. So that leaf is allowed to decompose. Um, with the white tea, it's just air dried. So it's very milder. It's a more of a delicate flavor than a typical black tea. And you can even see it, you know, in the leaves. You know, this looks really different than what a black I, tea smells, would look like. I don't know which one I'm going, it's probably both. <laughs> it yeah. smells incredible. So like a chai would be mostly black tea, cardamom, seed pod, ginger, pepper. Do they each have their own kind of, I don't want to say healing elements, but, but different things that make them good for you. Yep, yeah, white teas are really, it's the first bud and then two leaves under it. Mm. Um, so it has a lot of antioxidants. That baby bud that comes out is just jam-packed with all kinds of antioxidants. So do you sell it loose like this then? Yes, And so loose. you have different teapots to help people, because yep. they're not in a bag, so right. you have to right. steep a little So little yeah, you would, you would actually spoon your leaves into an infuser or a brew basket and 
pour your water over those leaves or fruit or whatever we have. This is a turmeric, so this has um, turmeric and ginger and cinnamon and orange peel and peppercorn. So this is a very healthy tea. This is one of our wellness blends. We are in mostly healthy grocery stores, but a lot of specialty markets. So um, a lot of um, stores that, that carry organic or maybe hard to find things. We're also in a lot of the restaurants in Cleveland um, and coffee houses too. So it's, it's a really nice mixture. We're able to sell tea by the pound or by the retail box. So, so customers can serve it and sometimes they sell the box as well as serving it to their customers. Well, if they all smell like this one does, <laughs> I'm in, forget my English breakfast, and I'm, I'm moving on to the pomegranate yeah. white tea. So this is a fair trade if you want to try that. That actually has a green tea, jasmine green tea, and a rooibos tea from South mm. Africa. And then lemon myrtle, lemon grass. It has they a little smell so good. bergamot. You, I know in I there. need to expand my horizons, and <laughs> I think this is the way I would go if I were, were to do it because this is delicious. Thank you. You don't even need sugar with these. That's the best <laughs> part. It's so healthy. Ah, thank you so much for having me in Thanks. again. I feel privileged to be in here. Thank but again, you. So many different places you can check out Storehouse Tea. Thank Love you. Thanks, Thanks for Paula. having us. Well, just when you think you've seen it all here at the Hildebrand Building, there's something else to discover. Another treasure. This one's called Darbin Woods. <laughs> My wife wanted a headboard. We couldn't find a headboard that we liked. So what I ended up doing was taking a class at um, Monticello Junior High School through the community programs of teaching adults. And then from there I went to, I made nightstands. And then started getting more and more equipment for my own house and making more and more things for shows. Last week I was making three, 400 cutting boards. I'll use a lot of glue just because I'd rather them not come apart. They'll go through and I'll plane them down. I cut them down into five different sizes, a 10 inch, 12 inch, eight inch, 15 and 18. So what I'll do then is take them, soak it in the mineral oil, so you can see how the mineral oil goes from different colors. Between now and show season, I'll be making a few hundred pens. Um, have the cutting boards done. I'll do more bottle openers or shaving brushes or razors. Well, you know, one of the things is I like to make useful items. So one of the things I make are fountain tip pens. And when I use woods from around the world, you know, this one is from African blackwood, which is, you know, one of the tougher woods to get around. It's very hard. People like to pick up wood, touch it, and feel it. And that's what I want to go with. So it's working through a project and saying, you know, is it soft enough? Is the corners rounded over enough? You know, because a sharp edge on something does make people happy. But you know, that nice little bit, you know, adds so much more to a product. I do a lot of modern things, and then I share my stuff with Tom Biesecker, who does stuff on the totally opposite side of me. He does a lot of blanket chests, jewelry chests, out in the 18th century style of using dovetails for all the drawers. Curly maple for the woods, or curly cherry, high-end, lovely woods that give great finishes. Instead of using a polyurethane finish that a lot of people use today, he's gonna dye it first to bring out that old world color to it. I have stuff at the um, Heights Arts Gallery. I do art shows throughout the whole summer and the spring and the fall. Um, a lot of bizarre Cleveland shows, but I also do Lakewood, Hudson, Chardon, you know, many of the community festivals throughout the city. You know, it really comes back to, it was one of those things that I made for myself. And I, made, I actually made it for my wife because that's what she wanted. She couldn't get it anywhere else. So I learned a skill to be able to make it for her. To find out where Darwin Woods will be next, just go online. And if you can't wait, you can check out his page on Etsy. Hey, still to come, check it out. We're talking about kimchi, sauerkraut, and more.
It's like a magical mystery tour. That's right. Welcome back to New Day Cleveland. We're at the Hildebrandt Building, a building of dreams. And you might know Mike Rolf here from uh, his antique store over at 79th and Lorraine, right? 79th and Lorraine, correct. Okay, but he is deep within this building here because this is sort of a workshop where you, what, create stuff for the store? Yeah, we bring everything here first and clean it up and make everything right here. Talk about making, like there's some, there's some odd items here, like there's a 50 gallon drop tank that's around here. We, we've got a, a strange mannequin hanging up in, in the skylight and that sort of thing. But then you got this, like this cabinet here behind us that is, what is it and what could uh, it be? It'll be a showcase for somebody. A specimen cabinet lights up, um, used in an old college, probably to put birds or animals in. They always had stuffed animals. Yeah. So that's something that's that's already built. But as we walk over here and check some things out, you see all the tools and the bits and pieces. We've got a table that's trestle coming base. To life here, huh? Correct. Trestle base for the uh, old woodworking table. So this is like so it, you would put this in your store. Or you're going to make this for somebody specifically here, and then they would. Buy uh, it? I know this would be right in the store. Right in the store. Yes. So this thing started as a just a couple big giant beams from a factory. Correct. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, large beams from a factory um, cemented in the ground, in the dirt. Um, they were ripped out and we fabricated into the base. I also saw some stuff here that looked like old molds. Foundry from molds, correct. Foundry molds, yeah. yeah, they would have been for sand casting. Some of them you have no idea what they would have been used for, but we make anything from mirrors out of them to uh -huh. just artwork. A lot of people are into this reclaimed wood thing here, and you've got a deep wood stash, man. Yes. You've got a lot yeah. of stuff here. So yeah. when you pick this stuff up, do you know what you're going to do with it, or do you just pick it up and then you no, we have a, as oh, you go? Oh, no, no, sure. we got a great idea of what we're going to do with it before we even get it. Yeah. Yes. Um, but some stuff sits around for a year, and some stuff will get used immediately. This is great. It's like it's like an erector set that with, with no directions. <laughs> yeah. You just start putting stuff together. So this over here is going to be the top to That'll this table. That'll be the top from it. That was reclaimed out of a Cleveland factory. Um, we'll clean it up, uh, do a little sanding on it, and coat it. That'll be the top for the trussel base. And then we got this, this is like an old machinist table or something, huh? Ah, uh, we just got that. Yeah, that was out of a pattern making shop, uh, making foundry molds. It turns. Oh, um, so nice. what we would do to it, who knows? Uh, maybe put a round top on it and let people, you yeah. know, it'll turn for whatever reason, but it'll be a base for a table. Is this a tool or a? Cigar cutter. <laughs> no. Yes. You're kidding. Well, so when they come over to your place, everything's got a great story. Uh, pretty much so, yes. Yeah, yeah it's tentatively you cannot, uh, where you've been, people would never realize. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy sometimes. I did all the time. I drive down the street and I wonder what's going on in this building, like the Hildebrandt building, and now you know what's going on in here in one corner of it. So it's great really cool building, great building. I also smell something right now, like somebody's cooking something over there. So I think we're going to head over to, there's, there's a commercial kitchen on the other side. Yes. You got some more of those Brussels sprouts? We have, um, we call it our CHAP Meals on Wheels program because Meals on Wheels is, our Meals on Wheels program is focused on people who are in crisis or who have a chronic or acute health condition. And what they need is they need a program, CHAP, to actually give them some Meals on Wheels, some healthy food to eat. So we focus a lot in terms of our food on how we prepare it as well as what it is. Most of it is organic, um, a lot of it is gluten free because we're kind of looking at the food as medicine model in terms of how we prepare the food and then what we're serving to the people who need it. Everyone who works in the CHAP kitchen actually is someone who's low income and who is trying to decrease their dependency on their benefits. They're looking for a job or they're gonna start their own business. So we're kind of that stepping stone towards their focus in terms of employment. And so the people who come to us they actually have experience. Either they've gone to culinary school and hadn't got a chance to finish, they've been in the military, they've worked for a stadium for several years, and now they're, they're coming into their second retirement, <laughs> so to speak, um, because trying to make ends meet is kind of hard. A lot of the times, the individuals that are coming to our program, they're being referred to us by a hospital or a clinic by physical therapist, um, that kind of thing. And so we get a chance to talk to their, to that, that caseworker or that care worker, that nurse, and they're saying, hey, this person needs more vitamin D. The most rewarding part of the job, I would say, is probably the cooking, because everybody likes to taste. So being able to taste everybody's different uh, culinary skill 
uh, is, is, pretty, is pretty cool. And then also being able to, at the end of it, know that it's going to a person who really needs the food. We kind of get to know the clients as the food is delivered because as they keep coming back for more food, then we get to know what they like, what they don't like. We even ask them, hey, if you have a, a preference for something, let us know so that we can kind of cater to their need a little bit. Not too much, because we still got to be healthy, um, but cater to what they're kind of looking for a little bit. And that's also fun, kind of getting to know the client through the food. Chap Meals is always looking for donations, people to help deliver meals. And of course, if you want to help cooking the meals, they're looking for you too. And if you're interested, just go online for the information. More discoveries coming up after the break. Welcome back to New Day Cleveland. We continue our exploration for treasure in the Hildebrandt building, right? Our next stop takes us to the studio of an architectural glass artist. Architectural blown glass is the name I've given this current body of work, which is in its 10th year now. I once thought I would be an architect and uh, realized that it was more technical than artistic and uh, so I decided to go to art school instead. Glass is a really versatile material and I think what I do with it takes full advantage of everything it can do, its fluidity, its transparency, and its moldability. And uh, I create molds out of graphite that give the glass structure by blowing the glass into the mold. And that's where the imagery for the architectural reference comes in. Then I take these blown forms and uh, cut them up and build them into larger compositions, or I can make them into a standalone piece as well, uh, functional or non-functional. When I'm blowing glass, the day is completely devoted to blowing glass. And, and I'll work for a period of weeks making the blown forms, and then I'll cease blowing glass, and then I'll come into this part of the studio to do all the cutting and composing and finishing of the work, grinding and polishing, cutting. And, and then there's the time on the road. I spend between 45 and 60 days a year traveling all over the United States to exhibit my work at juried fine craft and fine art festivals. I bring along all of my display, all of my work, everything I'll need to set up a temporary store for two to four days. And the public is invited to come. So you'll experience the, the whole gamut. Everybody from very sophisticated collectors to people who have never really had much chance to look at art before. And that's one of the great things about art fairs because you really get the broad spectrum of people. There's an initial spark of inspiration, which is some image of a building that I've seen print or in person. Whenever I travel, I'm taking reference photographs. I look up to the decorative cornice of a building from 1917, or one of the pieces on the display is inspired by native Puebloan structures in American Southwest, and another piece is inspired by Greek architecture. And all of them, really, I think they have a bit of an art deco feel. What I have before me here today are blown sections of glass that were formed in the graphite mold. And I spent several days, uh, really starting in December and working through January to make these forms a family of pieces, as I call them, that are all complementary, And they're intended for a piece that I'm building for a client in Philadelphia. I'll mark these, decide where I'll 
take a section of this to cut on the brick saw. I like it when people come in to my gallery or booth at an art fair and they see something completely different than what I intended. Um, and I, of course I love it when they see really what I do intend. When they recognize the reference to the architectural forms. You can explore Michael's work online and also find out where he's going to be next because he goes to shows all over the United States. Well, I have moved down to the basement because we are at Wake Robin Fermented Foods and it's not hard to find if you just use your sense of smell, I must say. Molly, this is this is your doing. This is your your baby, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And you have quite a variety of different fermented foods that you make here. We do, yeah. We uh, make um, several different types of sauerkraut. We have a sauerkraut that is plain, which is cabbage and sea salt. We have one with cranberries and ginger that's a seasonal product. We have one with beets, turnips, cabbage, apple, juniper and black pepper, and then some other fermented vegetables as well. We have, oh, I guess the kimchi is kind of a sauerkraut as well. The kimchi is what you're in the process. You, Steve, and, and Molly over there are making today. Yes. So kimchi, I know, is one of those things that people sometimes either love or hate, right? But yes, it's amazing for sure. if you do love yeah, it. Yeah, a lot of people love it. So how did you guys get into this type of business? So do you just have a love of fermented foods or what made you do it? For sure, yeah. This was uh, my hobby for a while. I do have a love of fermented foods. I worked at some farms. Um, I was learning about all the amazing health benefits of this type of food. So it just be and, and also just really fun work. It's. Um, it's kind of science and food in one, which are kind of two of my interests. It's so true. When you look at some of this equipment that you have down here, it looks like I'm in a lab. <laughs> yeah, I mean, or a big <laughs> kitchen. I guess that's a funny looking that's tool. A fun. So they're but... cutting up all of the ingredients that you're going to be putting in. Yeah. And I know you were you're ju you were juicing some ginger too. Yeah. So there's a lot. How much? I should say, how many pounds would you make, say, in one day of one product? Uh, today we're going to make 600 pounds of kimchi, which is kind of an average. That's an um, average? Yeah. Well, sometimes we can make a place. A, you need to make a lot. We do make a lot. And we've become pretty efficient. We got some hard workers here. <laughs> we got a good team. And um, yeah, when we make sauerkraut, we can make 1,000 pounds in a day. So a thousand just, pounds in a day. So yeah. these, this is how it works. They cut up everything. And then this is just kind of getting it in the process of getting these ready These are to basically go. our mixing bowls. Okay. So we have, um, this is where we get all the ingredients, we compile them together, um, we let them soak in the salt and, we, and um, for a while and then we end up putting them in the barrels with a lid and an airlock which is a kind of a tool that comes from like beer and wine fermenting as well. Actually our process starts at the farm. We have a meeting every year with a group of farmers that we work with and we order our vegetables, they're actually ordering seeds at that time, so they, um, we order our vegetables, they plan their farm, and then we buy them throughout the year. We're not even finished buying our cabbage this year, it's still coming in. So again, there's quite, how many different items you make? Because I see seven up there, and I yeah. know there's cauliflower back there, right. so, yeah. so you got a lot. Have, well, we probably have nine this year, because we, may, we have cauliflower, which is coming out in, um, in probably February or March, and then um, in the last summer we made um, dill pickle spears as well. So we have kind of a variety of different products that we've made. You can get them in Heinen's. Heinen's, uh, all the mustard seeds, um, Westside Market, and then a, a lot of little shops have um, started to carry our things. So Grace Brothers, Tremont General Store, Ohio City Provisions, um, the grocery. So a lot of like little shops around town. Krieger's is also a great place to get it if you're on the um, in Cuyahoga Falls. So well, once you pick around. it up, now you know where it's made and who's making it. That's right. And they are delicious. Let okay. me tell you. Thanks so much for having us down here in the Thank basement. You. Yeah. There are so many floors and so many different places to explore. We'll be back with more after the break. Disown Customs. Welcome back to New Day Cleveland. It's our journey through the Hildebrandt building. And I'm with Danny right now, who is the captain of this ship. Is that right? Aye, aye. aye Certainly. Aye. So I walk in here and I see a lot of uh, motorcycles. So it must yes. be a motorcycle business. That is what we do. And some of them look like they're crippled. What's going on here? <laughs> well, we have a lot of bikes. A lot of them are in different 
you know, they're, how do I put it? They're, they're all older bikes. You different know, so kinds too. Different kinds, different models, different makes, different years. Disowned. Um, they're all disowned, That's yeah. That's why you got the name then, right? No, my mother actually told me if I ever got a motorcycle, she'd disown me. Ha! That's <laughs> a better story. That's fantastic. So now I've made a living out of it. Um, and that's where the name actually came from. But we, you know, we take a lot of bikes that normal people mm -hmm. generally stop riding. They think they're undesirable, they're old. We love bringing those bikes back to life, putting them back on the road. And a lot has to go into them. A lot of them get dug out of barns. A lot of them are just found on the streets, decaying away, rusting. So, you know, that's why you see them in different areas, yeah. you know, wiring here, you know, engine work here. We're talking about there. a love too. Like I saw, I, I met one of your mechanics over here, or, or our partner or something, but this guy, yes. man, he started talking about motorcycles and he was like, his eyes light up and you know, he's- How can you not get excited talking about motorcycles? Well, I mean, it's, it I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm sure people get excited about accounting and numbers and crunching. I've met engineers that get excited about writing code. Yeah. You know, that's just our passion is motorcycles. No, I walked in, I saw the big screen TV over there and I think I saw you on TV. I was on TV. So what's going on with that? Oh, you know what? We, we had this cool show, you know, a production company came out here and said, hey, you're doing a lot of cool stuff. You're yeah. working on these old bikes. You know, there's people partying and drinking and doing this. Let's make a TV show show out of it. Sounds like Somehow. a TV show to me. It sounds like a TV show and uh, we, we filmed some here at the Hildebrandt building. That was our season finale. Mm -hmm. um, we filmed a lot in LA, you know, in a studio type of environment. That's and, great. Uh, it was neat. It, it was a very they neat They put you experience. in a makeup chair? Uh, no, actually, they didn't put me in a makeup chair unless we were doing promos. Maybe we put you on one of these chairs. Yeah, now this stuff, definitely, you know. What um, is this thing? This is crazy. It's got four cylinders on it, huh? So yeah. That, and it's, it's got a really odd suspension. I mean, all these different bikes here you see from, you know, some of them are like, it looks like they'll never run again, but you bring them all back to life. So yeah. what's the story on this one? Um, this is, uh, actually, the engine is a 72 CB504. It's a Honda. You all, know? all of our audience knows about that. Engine. Absolutely. You know, um, it's an air-cooled engine. You know, it's actually really simple to work on. A lot of people are afraid to get into engines. You know, here we like to encourage it. It's carbureted. So we got a nice painter, Brian. Mm -hmm. He actually uh, does tattoos out in North Ridgeville and uh, he also paint, pinstripes and paints. And so stuff. you can get that on your arm if you want. I do, actually. <laughs> I <laughs> actually is. do. You know, I like this place. Yeah. So the, the, so when do the when do the parties take place? When you finish a bike? or In the summertime. Yeah? In the summertime. Um, a lot of times, yeah. You know, uh, we have a great partnership with like Platform and with Cleveland Whiskey and with Whiskey Grade in Ohio yeah. City. Um, we partner up and, and we like to get group rides going and we like to be involved in the Very community. social. We're very social. You know, we like to invite people to the building because mm -hmm. Everybody that comes here is, the first thing they always say is, you never knew this was here. So how many old bikes you think you got here? Oh God, maybe 30, 35 yeah. old bikes. I stopped counting. Is this place ever <laughs> gonna get empty or is it gonna keep getting more full? You know full? what, in the winter time, it gets full because a lot of people, we offer winter storage. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people live in Lakewood or in apartments or in some kind where they don't have a place to put their bike in the winter time. So, right. you know, they come here, they pay storage fees and uh, it stays warm, it's secure. And, and then we're able to keep an eye on it to make sure the batteries don't lose charge. And, you know, so when they're ready to ride, they can just come in, hop on it, and uh, get on the road. So we're gonna tell all our folks, all our, our audience for New Day Cleveland. Yes. They, they got an old bike in the garage. They know where to go now, right? Yeah. This, this, is, this is a spot. But of course, you come to the Hildebrand building, there's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of cool we, stuff here. We've got here. the glass people, we've got the ceramics people, we've got food, we've got coffee, we've got tea. Woodworkers. It's a whole bunch of stuff. Woodworkers. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's a great place. And what's the address here? How do you get here? 3619 Walton Avenue. We're right one block away from Clark and Fulton. You know, the, the West Side Market's right down the street. Ohio City is right down there. And if you have a vintage bike and nobody will touch it, or if you want the coffee, the glass, or whatever. So here it is, and if you can't remember all that, just go to our website, and you'll learn everything you need to know about the Hildebrand Building. And, and what's the slogan here? The Building of Dreams. There you yes. go. Oh. I'm David Boss, <laughs> and for Natalie Herbeck, we'll see you in the next New Day Cleveland. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you.